to pick Dr. Osborne's brain on this Good Friday, or Thursday rather, day before Good Friday. So we've got a lot of questions already coming in. If you're new to the show and you'd like to ask your question, um, go ahead and start typing that into the feed. I'm going to get as many of those answers as I answered as I can within the allotted time frame. And if you're new to the show, welcome aboard. Um, you should go over to glutenfreesociety.org after the show. Make sure you sign up for our updates there so that um, we can send you a, a, just a plethora of free information on how to navigate diet to overcome autoimmunity. Also, many of you um, have been inquiring about um, not being able to get our show reminders. Sometimes we get censored for whatever weird algorithmic re reason. Um, you, can you can actually sign up for our text reminders when we go live. So if you don't want to miss a live, you can sign up for our text reminders. We will put um, that information in the feed for you here just shortly. So let's start with questions. Elsie, I'm taking betaine um, hydrochloride with meals for low stomach acid and also baking soda, lemon water and alkaline water throughout the day for cancer. Are they canceling each other out? I, you know, I don't know why you're using baking soda, Elsie. I, I just, I don't think that's a good idea. Baking soda is going to neutralize your stomach acid. You're taking betaine hydrochloride to enhance your stomach acid to improve your ability to digest and absorb, particularly to digest and absorb proteins and certain minerals like iron and vitamins like vitamin B12. Um, there's just not, you know, a lot of people have, um, let's just say kind of a misleading ideology around the alkaline diet. You can eat alkaline based foods. You can eat healthy foods that alkalinize the body, but to take directly something, um, that has a very high pH in an attempt to alkalinize the body, not really going to be super effective. So not, not a big fan of the baking soda, um, consumption as, uh, in an attempt to try to alkalinize for, especially, you know, for chronic illnesses, including cancer. Why is soy something you don't test for in your food sensitivity test? We do. Um, I don't know what you're referring to, Rhonda, but we do test for soy in our LRA testing. Uh, as far as procedure for introducing foods that you are positive, you know, my, um, my guidance on that is one, you might want to take our webinar on that, Rhonda, because I go into a lot of depth and I think that webinar would be super helpful for you. But just again, to answer your question, eight months, um, you go eight months of, of avoidance. Any of the foods that you come back reactive to, you want to go a solid eight months. Why not six months? Why not three months? Mainly because we want to get through an entire rotation of your immune cells and that takes six to eight months to get through. So you, you, you get through that full cycle so that your immune cells, the system basically is reset. So you don't, you wouldn't try any reintroduction until that point. Hi, my name is Helena. Um, I have an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis. I am keto. I can control it with food, but why is pressure cooked food so bad for rheumatoid? Pressure cooked food isn't necessarily bad for rheumatoid. I don't know where you've heard that um, or where you got that information, but there's nothing wrong with pressure cooking your food if you have rheumatoid arthritis. So I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. Um, learn. I have a learning center where I work with children with autism. Um, most of them have autoimmune issues as well. Can I interview you? Um, for any interview requests, reach out to jessica at glutenfreesociety.org. Um, that's for any of you watching the show. If you, you know, if you have a podcast and interview request, you can reach out to Jessica that way. Um, and send us your information and we'll look at it. We'll check it out and, and, um, and get, get a response to you. Some functional doctors say to only eat fruit or fruit and vegetables and avoid animal protein. It's hard to know which to follow. Any doctor of any type who makes a broad sweeping claim that everyone should do exactly this um, 
without having a way to objectively back that up or test or measure, they're generalizing. And um, there's a huge, huge community of people who do tremendously terrible on only fruits and vegetables. And there's a huge community of people that do really well on only fruits and vegetables. It's because there's not a one size fits all. And so if you're working with a doctor who's telling you to do that, but not not measuring why, not actually justifying why they want you to do that, but just generically saying this is what you should do, run as far away from that doctor as you can. Again, there's no such thing as a one size fits all diet approach. And it's, in my opinion, it's, it's just not great advice or guidance. What are your thoughts on appeal, the coating uh, that's being put on some organic fruits and vegetables? Avoid it. Um, write your grocer, tell them you don't want that nonsense. What, what we're seeing on a lot of these is that coating um, that's wrapped around that appeal coating, um, it diminishes what we think is happening is it diminishes nutritional value of the food itself. Um, it's just not something that needs to be on these products. I think it's just somewhere along the line. Somebody made a back end deal to, to make a ton of money off of reprocessed garbage food that couldn't be sold. And so they made a slurry out of it, named it appeal, and then, you know, tried to sell it to to consumer uh, produce departments to protect the vegetables from deterioration. But um, it's been my experience that those products are poor um, and are not as nutritionally valuable and don't taste as well either. So I don't use it personally. I don't recommend anyone else do either. Uh, let's see, Mira from Holland. How could I order the vitamin nutrition test from you? I'm writing, uh, but no one's answering. Um, you know, the old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, I don't know how many times you've written in um, to Malaya at Gluten Free Society. But um, again, her email is glutenology at gmail.org. Um, right now, the team and the uh, staff are a little bit backed up. So um, persistently write in again. And um, somebody will get back with you. We're just we're we're pretty backed up right now. Julie asks, "What are your thoughts on B6 toxicity? I was taking an excellent multivitamin, and then my B6 levels were elevated. I'm concerned about taking a multi with B6 in it again, but I feel like I'm missing nutrients." So, good question, Julie. It, part of it's how, they, how you were tested. If they did a serum lab test on you to, and said your vitamin B6 levels were high based on a serum lab test, um, I would be less concerned about a toxicity issue unless you were symptomatic. Um, symptomatic toxicity of vitamin B6 generally manifests as some type of neurological symptom. So it can manifest as numbness, tingling, nerve pain in the hands or feet. Uh, and extreme irritation, agitation, or irritability. So those are just potential reasons or um, B6 toxicity symptoms. If you weren't having those, you know, without seeing your lab, again, um, hard, hard to really make a judgment. But um, a lot of serum lab tests are going to go high if you're taking a good multivitamin. We see the same thing all the time with vitamin B12 and folate and other B vitamins being higher than the reference range on serum blood work. But again, that doesn't it, high on a reference range doesn't indicate toxicity. To, for toxicity to be there, there needs to be a set of symptoms or problems associated with the use of that product. Can gluten sensitivity or celiac disease cause hyperkeratosis or parakeratosis in the mouth? Yes, uh, we see a lot of that go away in people after they go on gluten-free diets. Is it possible to get celiac disease because of child abuse? No, I mean, I wouldn't say so. I would say that the stress of a child being abused could certainly trend to lead toward increased risk factors. Um, but as far as like, does it cause celiac disease? No, what causes celiac disease is gluten exposure. But stress can also induce intestinal hyperpermeability and so can create a lot of problems with nutrition and might exacerbate as well uh, in a pre-existing celiac. 
Can a vasectomy cause autoimmune response? And if so, is there any remedy? Um, generally not. Now, some vasectomies, depending on what you've had done, if you've got a vasectomy where they use clips, you know, and, you're re and your body's reacting to the material in the clips, there's a potential possibility for that. It's, it's actually, there's a name for it. It's called Asia, autoimmune syndrome induced by um, adjuvants and that, uh, or other materials, other toxic materials. Again, everybody's body perceives different materials, external materials differently. And if your body is reacting to those clips, it certainly could uh, contribute to an autoimmunity. But I, I would argue that that's not the most, we'll just say not the thing that I would put at the top of the list of the greatest degree of likelihood of why you might have autoimmunity. Um, food, chemical exposures, nutritional deficits, and microbial imbalances would be the things that I would prioritize looking at first. If you prioritize those and apply those and you still struggle, then you might start looking at, okay, you know, do you have vasectomy clips that your body's reacting to? Um, and those things can also be tested for as well. I mean, um, we test for it all the time in our practice and, uh, even dentists will test a lot of good dentists. The biological dentists will test before they operate or before they do oral surgery. They'll measure to see what you might react to in terms of the cavity filling or the materials that they're going to implant into you. Um, to me, every surgeon should be measuring people's immune system response to the materials that they're implanting. Um, because the technology exists, it's there and it makes sense to do it. And, you know, this goes for any of you, whether it's a vasectomy clip or whether it's a hip replacement or um, any other type, like a hernia mesh or any other type of foreign agent that's going to be implanted in your body for any length of time, you should do a, you know, a, a, an immune reaction or immune response test to determine whether or not there's a potential risk that you would react to whatever it is you're about to have embedded. Uh, can you talk about inositol for weight loss? A little bit. Um, inositol is very critical for proper formation and function of thyroid hormone. And in that regard, um, is very important for maintenance of your metabolism or your metabolic function. So if you're low in inositol, it could potentially impact your thyroid function and slow it down and thus contributing to weight gain. Now, inositol also very critical for managing fat in the liver, your liver can actually start to become fatty and cirrhotic with a severe enough inositol deficiency. And when your liver can't manage and package fat appropriately, that can cause um, a longer term inflammatory response that leads to weight gain as well. So those are just two mechanisms where inositol might or could play a role. Is there any natural treatment for Sjogren's? I have dry sinus, mouth, throat, and eyes. Yeah, I mean, it's the same for any autoimmune condition. Again, this question comes in a lot, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of summarize. If you have autoimmunity, whether it's Sjogren's, whether it's Hashimoto's, whether it's Graves, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, ankylosing spondylitis, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, or any of the other 140 types of autoimmune diseases, understand autoimmunity is a process. What doctors have done is they've labeled it uniquely to the tissue that it's affecting. So like Sjogren's is going to be an autoimmune response against the tear ducts and uh, the salivary production glands in the mouth predominantly. And so they call that Sjogren's. Um, but the autoimmune process is, is not different. A person could have um, an autoimmune reaction in one tissue, or it could have another autoimmune reaction in another tissue. As we know, if you've watched me for any length of time, you've heard me say this, the average person who develops one autoimmune disease will ultimately go on to develop six more in their lifetime if they don't figure out what's driving the autoimmune process. So think of autoimmune disease not as a singular disease where you get this label or diagnostic term. Think of it as a underlying process that occurs and your how your body manifests the illness is um, how your body manifests it. It's unique to you. And so again, some people with that underlying process will manifest Sjogren. Some will manifest Hashimoto. Some will manifest fill in the blank. And many will manifest multiple forms of autoimmunity if they don't figure it out. So what causes or what drives autoimmunity? Food, chemicals, microbes, and nutritional deficit are the four biochemical driving forces behind autoimmunity. If you have your doctor assess those four areas, 
you now understand what your potential triggers are and you can change those things. Those are diet and lifestyle changes that you can make. So when you ask me, is there a natural way to treat Sjogren's or a natural way to treat fill in the blank autoimmune disease, measure food, chemicals, microbes, and nutritional deficiencies and adjust your diet and lifestyle accordingly. Uh, let's see here. Can you turn off the celiac gene once it's expressed itself? Yeah, stop eating gluten. That's how you turn it off. That's how you turn off the expression. There's no way to turn it off otherwise. And, um, you know, they're, they're working all, all different types of new drug treatments for celiac. But, you know, I think that's a pipe dream. Um, I think anybody who buys or goes down that road is fooling themselves. You're, when your body sees a food as a poison, you don't try to trick it into not thinking it's a poison. That to me is a huge mistake. Um, but more power to those that, you know, just have a different philosophy. Thank you for sharing your great information. I'm in remission from three years with RA, rheumatoid arthritis. I can attest to your beliefs on autoimmune. I have researched, I read your book and follow your podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that testimonial. We really do appreciate you having the courage to speak up. So many people um, are lost here and just don't know where to start. So I'm glad it was helpful. What are the best herbs, vitamins, et cetera, to maintain RA in remission? It's not, it's not what are the best herbs, vitamins, et cetera. It's what is best for you. Um, herbs do not put autoimmunity in remission. Herbs are used to treat the symptoms of autoimmunity, and that would be what we call green medicine. So um, just like doctors love to use different drugs, there's disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs like methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine. There's also you know, you've got um, a host of biologic medications like Embril and Humira that doctors love to treat people with um, to silence their symptoms. You can use herbs that have any inflammatory effects. I mean, there's plenty of those. You can use things like turmeric and um, you can use other, other anti-inflammatory herbs, as, as garlic, oregano, et cetera. But um, that's green medicine, meaning you don't want to treat these symptoms of your inflammation. You want to have behaviors that align with your body's unique needs so that you're not driving excessive inflammation that would cause the symptoms and the development of RA. So it's not like what, what's the best thing to take because it's not what's the best thing to take. It's what can you behave, how can you behave to prevent it? Now, if you're just talking about general nutrition, a good multivitamin is a fantastic idea, in my opinion, a good omega-3, um, two grams a day of ome concentrated omega-3 is a very good idea as just nutrition support. But beyond that, it's very unique to the individual. Um, and, and more than 10,000, actually we've done, I've, I've done probably an estimated over 50,000 nutritional panels on patients in the last 23 years. And uh, so I would argue that I've probably done more of this than anyone alive. I, you know, I don't know that for sure, but I, I could validly make that argument because not many people check nutrition, uh, especially when it comes to doctors. But uh, what you should have your levels measured and you should supplement or eat according to your needs. That's the best way to be preventative about it, Miriam. That's partly why we offer nutrition testing at Gluten Free Society because for years, we didn't offer it on purpose because we wanted people to go have a relationship with their doctor. But the feedback we kept getting was doctors don't care about nutrition and they, they call me crazy and they refuse to measure it. So we said enough is enough. We put it online so that you could go at least have access to testing services, get the information and be able to make better decisions about how to approach your nutritional health. What are your thoughts about organic buckwheat? I don't recommend it. Um, have you ever considered to sell your supplements in Europe? We, we have, but it's a logistics issue that we're trying to work out. Um, I tested positive for celiac disease with HLA DQ2 and 8, but all antibody tests were negative. I am confused. My doctor told me I'm totally celiac. Well, you've got the positive gene markers for, for gluten sensitivity and celiac predisposition. And so what, what you should probably do, Ara, is reach out to my staff and see if you can attend one of our webinars on um, what your genetic test results mean. Um, it's, it's probably an hour and a half long conversation to give you a really great answer. How long does it take for the body to recover from nerve pain after eliminating gluten and grains? Uh, nerve pain takes longest. 
um, or can because nerves are slower to heal than other forms of tissue. Um, I've seen nerve pain go away in as little as a few days, and I've seen it take as much as, as, um, as six months to really start recovering. So be patient with it. Um, that being said, you can have nerve pain as a result of gluten exposure, but you can also have nerve pain for other reasons. And one of the things that happens in people that have gluten sensitivity is for decades they've been eating it. They're finding out now they're allergic or sensitive to gluten, so they're cutting it out of their diet. But the years of gluten consumption has led to malabsorption of vitamins and minerals. And so part of their nerve, nerve issue or nerve damage is not just gluten induced. It's also nutritional deficiency induced. And so you could have, you know, a gluten free diet and not see kind of improvement in your neuropathy because your vitamin B12 is also lower, your folate is lower, your B6 is lower, your copper is lower, or you know, fill in the blank. There are a number of nutrient deficiencies that can cause neuropathy. And so you, again, this is one of the reasons to actually measure your nutritional status, because if you, if you don't know that information, you may not see the result that you're after with diet change alone. Now, some people do, uh, and I hope that you do, but if you're not, you really, sh after six months, you really should look at getting your nutrition status and assessed. What can we do about MS? We've got some great information on MS, Patty, but the best thing, you know, if I'm generalizing for you, go, go on the no grain, no pain diet. It's phenomenal. Um, I've seen cases of people with MS um, walk again. I've seen people in wheelchairs walk again. I've seen people on walkers you drop their walkers and walk again. I've seen people on crutches get off their crutches. It should post the story of um, is the case study we had on, on uh, multiple sclerosis. If you know what I'm talking about, Mel, it was an origins case study that we, that we published. We'll push, we'll put up a video for you to watch, to get some inspiration, Patty on, uh, this is a past patient I had years ago um, who recovered from her MS with diet change. My mom just diagnosed with GPA Wegner's. She is on steroids and immunosuppressant. What protocol supplement is best for her? She needs to get properly assessed. I mean, steroids and immunosuppressants for the rest of anyone's life is not, is not a game plan that's going to lead to um, an outcome that she wants, most likely. Again, these are autoimmune responses. So measure food, chemicals, microbes, and nutritional deficiencies and adjust accordingly. Regarding the emotional aspect of healing, does this require a specialist who works with the psycho to somatic manifestation of disease? Maybe, it depends on the person. Um, you know, I, I, I find in my own, in my own practice that for emotional healing, one of the best people in your life, if, if, if this fits you, is your spouse. Not that you should use your spouse as your therapist if you actually need therapy, but who loves you, trusts you, knows you better than the person you chose to spend the rest of your life with. And, you know, I think a lot of a lot of therapies are overrated. It's not to say they can't be helpful. That's not to say that you know, we should throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think it's always a good idea to start with your own self-internal conversation, start uh, with the people who you love, care, and trust before you put your emotional mental health in the hands of a stranger who may not know you or understand you as well as is necessary. So, um, but that, all that being said, there are plenty of great professionals out there that you could also seek out and work with as well. Is it okay to eat peanut butter? Generally, it's okay to eat peanut butter. It's not part of the no grain, no pain protocol. So if you're following no grain, no pain, peanut butter is not part of that. Um, where, you, where you have to be cautious with peanut butter too is mold contamination um, and also hidden ingredients. A lot of what people think is peanut butter is really nothing more than a little bit of crushed peanuts with a ton of hydrogenated vegetable oil and sugar. And that, you know, we wouldn't classify that as peanut butter. I've read that vitamin K2 cannot be tested because there's not a vitamin K2 blood test. That's not true. We test for it every day. 
Uh, we test for vitamin K2 in the form of MK4 and MK7 intracellularly. It's not hard to do. We also test for vitamin K1. So what you heard is incorrect. Uh, let's see. Part, part two of that question was my vitamin K1 was high. Do I have to worry about toxicity? I don't know that I've ever read a single report of, of a vitamin K toxicity. Um, a lot of doctors have a generic thought that because a vitamin is fat soluble, that it somehow holds a much higher yield for toxicity than a water soluble vitamin. I just have not seen that clinically pan out at all in real time, you know, working with thousands and thousands of people over decades of practice. Um, you know, that being said, um, it's hard for me to give you an answer because I don't know anything about you. I don't know if you're having any symptoms. I don't know enough about your history. I don't know whether or not you're on any other kinds of medications. So it's just really hard to, to give you a definitive. But, um, you know, again, if you're supplementing with vitamin K1 and your serum lab test comes back high, you know, you don't, you don't call that a toxicity. Higher levels don't indicate toxicity. Symptoms of toxicity indicate toxicity. So, it's, it's one of those situations where it's, you know, you've got to take your symptoms into consideration. Managing autoimmune disease triggers like stress and sleep disturbances. I've been employing various coping techniques, including prayer, meditation, visualization, breathing, exercises, physical activity, blue blocker glasses at night. Um, acupuncture, hypnosis. Um, however, given that stress is a significant trigger for me, I'm curious, is there any, are, are there any additional strategies you've encountered that effectively address the body's response to fight or flight? I have a suspicion that my heightened sensitivity to stress, significant trigger for my autoimmune condition could be linked to my mother's challenging pregnancy with me. I don't think that's it. Um, and I don't, I don't want to shut you down with that thought. I mean, maybe it is that, but I have seen a lot of autoimmune disease in my practice, a lot. I mean, mostly, almost all autoimmunity is what I see. Um, I've not met a person who couldn't overcome it because of a, of a potential perceived stress that happened in utero. Um, that's just my experience. It doesn't mean it might not be something you investigate. But my experience is that if you have, generally, if a person's got an emotional historical trauma um, that they're not, they haven't opened up with or dealt with, certainly that could be a trigger. But usually it's not as much that as it is the ongoing triggers that they're continually exposing themselves to. There's an old saying that um, those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. And we see a lot of uh, people um, who have an abusive backdrop, maybe as a child or an infant, um, because the type of trauma that happens, it, it can create for a lot of people, it can set up a repetitive behavioral brain pattern that where that person actually seeks the abuse. And that's where, you know, some types of therapies might be very beneficial, again, depending on, on the person. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or even addressed it properly, but I just wanted to give you my, you know, my, my feedback. Failing, um, hi, ALA is failing to convert to EPA. So those of you that don't know what that is, ALA, uh, alpha lino Linic acid is failing to convert to EPA, which is eicosapent to enoic acid. That's that's basically pre omega three trying to convert to active omega three, and the enzyme that does that requires vitamin B five for that conversion. So Robert, you might have a vitamin B five deficiency, or you might also have just a um, poor conversion. Um, ALA to EPA conversion is not fantastic in some people, and that could be part of your problem as well. But vitamin B5 deficiency might be playing a role in it. I have severe Renaud's 
syndrome that affects my hands the most? Is there anything that can be done to improve this situation? Yes. Renaud's is autoimmune, Betty. So if you've been watching, what do we say are the triggers for autoimmunity? Food chemicals, microbes, and nutritional deficiencies. Get with a doctor who understands that. Have those things measured and then adjust your life and diet accordingly. Understanding that it depends on the personal situation, if you would have to summarize, how does the process to get off of a biological medication look like? I mean, the process, step one is there's no medication adjustment whatsoever in an individual until they understand their triggers food, chemicals, microbes, nutritional deficiencies, Gaia. So that's step one is understand your triggers, measure them. Step two is apply your triggers or, or apply the antithesis of them, right? Take them out of your life, take them out of your diet, adjust your diet accordingly, supplement accordingly where it's necessary. Step number three is a period of observation. Observation is generally in 12 week intervals because you need enough time to pass to see effectively changes begin to happen. Now, some observation can also occur objectively. That observation would be things like, what are your markers? Um, if you're taking a biologic, the likelihood that you're taking it for some type of inflammatory rheumatological disease is, is most likely the reason you're on it. So what does your CRP look like? What does your ESR look like? These are common examples of inflammatory markers that can be monitored over time once once diet and lifestyle changes have been made. And so if those markers are starting to adjust down, if the trend is going down and the person is feeling better and has less pain and has less stiffness, then now, you know, depending on the biologic, a lot of biologics are injectables and they're done at intervals. So whether you're on an every four week or an every six or an every eight or whatever the doctor that prescribed the medicine to you has you on, now you begin the conversation with that doctor about potentially elongating out the time frame by which you're using that biologic. So if you're on an every four week schedule, for example, and you're feeling really good at four weeks, um, and the pain's not coming back and the stiffness is not coming back, you talk to your doctor about potentially extending that out six weeks. That's basically the gist of how you would want to do it. Of course, you always want to do that under medical supervision. Um, but I'm just trying to give you a general idea for what something like, uh, like a reduction might, how that might be done in an intelligent and safe way where you can still maintain your quality of life as you make dietary and lifestyle adjustments. In addition to diet changes, what can I do to increase neurotransmitters like acetylcholine? Um, I mean, acetylcholine, you need vitamin B1, you need vitamin B5, you need choline, um, you need magnesium to produce acetylcholine. So if you're low in any of those nutrients, you know, one, get them measured and, and learn so that you can adjust accordingly. Because, I mean, certainly you could eat foods that are rich in those nutrients as well and should. Um, but as far as how else with, with it's, it's not what you can do to increase your neurotransmitters so much as it, how can you enhance your body's ability to preserve and to recycle your neurotransmitters because acetylcholine is also a recycled neurotransmitter. So one of the things that can deplete neurotransmitters is super high intense activity. So think of that as a potential to, if you're doing really, really high intensity types of exercise or workouts, that might be something that puts more stress or pressure on your neurotransmitter systems, but also sleep. I mean, the best way to recover neurochemistry is, is sleeping within the right time frame. So going to bed on time and allowing your body the rest that it needs to recover. What causes men's hair loss in their 30s? Lots of different things. It's really, um, if it's not male pattern baldness and it's just generalized thinning, it could be protein deficiency. Um, there are a number of vitamin deficiencies as well, like biotin and um, nutrients like uh, omega-3 de deficits that can contribute to the hair thinning. Could be a hair care product that he's using that um, his his cells, uh, skin cells and hair follicles don't agree with. And so his hair isn't growing appropriately because the cells are being damaged. Um, so a lot of potential there. You might want to check out our, our show on hair loss, where we do a pretty deep dive on the potential, all the different ways and reasons why hair loss can occur.
I had chronic diarrhea as long as I ate dairy products. I have lactose intolerance. I got psoriasis. What did chronic diarrhea do to my body? Chronic diarrhea causes mal uh, absorption. So it's very possible that it uh, led to deficiencies of critical vitamins, minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids that your body requires to heal, maintain, and repair itself. So it's, it's, you know, it's also possible that, you know, if you've cut the dairy out at this point and you're eating a whole healthy diet and you're relatively healthy, that you've recovered those nutritional losses. The only really way to know for sure is to measure them. How do I bring my CK total levels down? I'm already working out and staying hydrated. So a couple of things on that, Shonda. CK, I would assume you mean creatine kinase, which is a blood marker that can indicate brain damage, it can indicate heart damage, and it can indicate muscle damage. So first things first, you, you can't just measure total CK without running what's called an isoenzyme test to determine whether your CK is elevated because of brain damage, muscle damage, or heart damage. So the first thing I'd ask you to do is talk to your doctor about doing a CK isoenzyme analysis. It's a simple blood test, but it will help you understand which of your CK enzymes is elevated because that's where your answer is going to be. Um, you know, what is damaging those tissues also, you know, is something that you have to figure out. I mean, there are a lot of things that can damage brain, heart, or muscle tissue. Um, and in, and in some people, you know, I've seen CK elevations aggressively when they're working out super hard. Um, and so that, you know, if you're already working out and you're working out really aggressively, that may be the reason your total CK is up. Hard to say, but remember when you go in to get the testing done, make sure you're fasted and make sure you haven't worked out that morning and make sure your muscles aren't super sore the day of the test. And that way you don't get a false elevation being caused by your workout. I've been gluten and dairy free for 10 years, Hashimoto's for 25 years, and now EOE. You, I, I assume you mean eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, where else can I look to slow this down? Eating clean, apparently not enough. Depends on the kind of gluten diet that you're following. Are you gluten-free traditionally where you're avoiding wheat, barley, and rye, or are you actually gluten-free where you're avoiding all grain? Um, because that would be you know, that would be one area to, to consider. Um, so if you are already on a grain-free diet, then you really should be getting tested because EOE is generally caused, in my experience, it's caused by two things. One, it's caused by food reactions. What you're currently eating is causing the irritation. Or two, uh, it's caused or contributed to by microbial imbalances either in the stomach. So things like high H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori. So you might ask your doctor to run that type of test to see if you have H. pylori. Um, but you've got, you need more analysis basically, because if you, if you're already eating super clean, there's something being, there's something triggering that and you have to, you have to determine what that is. Are there supplements I can ingest to support higher estrogen? You mean you're trying to, you're trying to increase your body's estrogen or you're trying to reduce high estrogen that your body has, um, best things to do in that, in that type of situation. If you're just trying, if you have low estrogen and you're trying to take a supplement that supports estrogen receptor activation, there's, there's a whole class of supplements called adaptogens. Probably two of the best. Um, well, one of them will be chase tree. If you haven't, if you don't know what chase tree berry is, it's a, it's a, it's a nice adaptogen for that. Um, it actually binds to estrogen receptors. And so because it has a similar structure, it can activate them. And so although that technically won't raise your estrogen, it will um, raise your estrogen-based activity. Um, we have a product called Ultra Balance that you might want to check out. It's got several different estrogen adaptogens in it, if, if that's what you mean. So I think I answered that question. What else can cause autoimmunity other than grains? Any food. It doesn't have to be grains. Any food. Um, microbes. Abnormal microbes can cause autoimmunity. Nutritional deficiencies can cause autoimmunity. And chemical exposures can be a trigger for autoimmunity. 
So those, those four are what we call the biochemical triggers. Now, stress, major stress, life-altering stress can also contribute. I don't want to undermine stress as a factor, especially those of you who watched the interview with Dr. McCullough on Tuesday. Her story is just such an amazing testimony to, you know, the journey of healing. Uh, any of you who are trying to struggling with autoimmunity who has who haven't watched that interview from from Tuesday it was phenomenal and you should check it out. This hair sample as good as a blood test for food sensitivity. Hair sample is a total waste of money and non scientific garbage. I do not recommend hair testing to measure your nutritional status. Um, just not a good medium. Hi, any, um, hi, anti TPO 1300 plus and TSH is a, I don't, I, that's not a question. I, you know, again, don't send me your lab results. I'm not, this is not, this show's not about interpreting your lab results and giving medical advice. Medical advice should come from your doctor that you're working with. If you're not happy with your doctor, find a new one. Um, this is more to answer generalized questions and educate you. What do you think about eating flaxseed every day? Flax, I don't like seed oils. I, I Look, I don't like personally, you know, a lot of people love oils and use oils and cook with oils. I'm just not a huge fan of oil products because once you crack open whatever it is, whether it's a seed or whether it's um, a, another plant-based item that you're extrapolating the oil from, if you're talking about human consumption, you know, orally eating it, um, that oil begins to oxidize the moment you crack it open. Um, depending on how they processed it, depending on whether that oil was cut with other oils, a lot of Health oils are cut with canola oil. It's a trick of the industry. You just don't know what you're getting. If I was going to eat flax, I'd rather have my own flax, and I would rather grind them and add them to something as opposed to using the oil itself. But um, but that's just my opinion on the matter. I think, I think a lot of these packaged processed oils, you know, you just don't know what you're getting. So it's really hard to to be confident in them. Love, love that. Marvin says, um, from East Texas, carnivore for four years, two-time colon cancer, stage three, and chem cancer free three years since going carnivore as of last week. I'm, I'm super, um, super excited for you, Marvin. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, and I, and I hope that that um, cancer stays gone for you. When doctor tells you you have IgA nephropathy, what does that actually mean? It means you have an autoimmune disease against your kidneys in a nutshell. Um, we have a really good article on gluten and kidney disease and autoimmune IgA nephropathy. You might want to check out. Um, we'll put a link for that um, in the comments below. Are all nutritional tests the same? No, um, not even close. What would you recommend for acne? What diet would be best? I would recommend finding out what your body needs. Now, again, there's not a one size fits all diet recommendation. The best one size fits all recommendation I could give anyone uh, is no grain, no pain. Follow the no grain, no pain diet. That's an anti-inflammatory diet that removes a huge chunk of the more common things I've seen in clinical practice over the years causing and driving people's autoimmune and inflammatory problems. As far as, as far as what supplements to take, it's always best to get tested if you're just trying to, to say, okay, what's healthy for the skin? Um, Omega-3 is very healthy for the skin. And uh, I would put that on the top five list of supplements to take for skin health. You might consider biotin. I would consider B-complex. I would si I consider a multivitamin on that list as well. And I might even consider when it comes to acne, I might consider vitamin A. However, if you're going to use higher doses of vitamin A over any extensive period of time, it's important to monitor your levels. Okay. 
why is ultra metal detox causing my son to be anxious? Um, if he's got metal in him and he's using the metal detox and a lot of times that as they're coming out, as you're chelating metal out, it can increase symptoms. It's, it's a, it's a common thing that happens. One of the things that you might try doing, uh, you know, beyond the discontinuance would be to cycle its use, take it for two days and then not take it for 12. Um, it's, part of how we do it clinically with people when we're trying to remove metal from them is we don't just put them on a metal chelator indefinitely every day. We actually cycle them off and on, especially those ones that are having symptoms. Um, and so cycling, what that does is it allows you to pull some, but then it allows that person to have a break and kind of a reprieve and a recovery time. So, um, Beyond that, it's hard to comment. There could be other things going on with your son that I'm just not aware of. What about hair, t hair samples for heavy metal testing? It's not a great test. I mean, you can learn some things about um, if somebody's being acutely poisoned over time with hair testing. I've actually seen that. We've had, I've had a case of years ago where um, we had a suspicion somebody was being poisoned. Um, and hair testing can be actually pretty good to measure over time to see whether somebody's being constantly exposed to acute doses of poison. But as far as is, is measuring for um, chronic lifelong exposure to, to heavy metals and having heavy metals inside your tissues that have been stored, hair testing is not all that accurate for that. And the best way to do that, Misty, would be what's called a post-provocation test where you you take a chelating agent and then you do a urine collection over several hour period of time. What a chelator does is it binds any metal in your tissue and pulls that out into the urine. Because if you just do a urine test, you might not find the stuff that's stored in the tissue. And that's where a lot of heavy metals go. Once you're exposed to them, if they're not detoxed out immediately, they can be stored in nerve tissue and fat tissue and bone tissue, et cetera. Platelets dropped um, and D-dimers elevated, wondering why. Could it be a result of COVID? Yeah, COVID, um, there have been some studies that show that COVID spike proteins can actually cause microclotting, and, and that's what D-dimers are. They're a measure of microclotting. So if you've had COVID recently, you could have D-dimer elevation, uh, very much a possibility. Do silicone implants break down over time? Yeah, they can. Um, I don't recommend implant surgeries. I just see too many women struggle with the fact that that's been done. Um, you know, and I know they, you know, a lot of, a lot of women, you know, opt to do that cosmetically and some women opt to do it because of like a breast cancer, you know, so this is not me shaming any of you who've had it done. Don't take it that way. But if you have a choice and it's a, you know, and it's an optional surgery for you to do. It's just not something I recommend. There's a risk that's involved with it. And one of those is the slow deterioration of the implant or the breakage of the implant or a recall on the implant or that your body might view the implant as a foreign agent and start attacking it. And, you know, in, in that can generate an autoimmune response. So again, if it's a, if it's a cosmetic choice and just don't encourage it. Love that. I quit experiencing Sjogren's symptoms when I stopped ingesting all grains. I was told by an endo I only went to once. The autoimmune is just the reason you are hypothyroid. We treat the thyroid. The autoimmunity is not even taken into consideration. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's like talking to a brick wall. Why wouldn't you treat the cause of the autoimmune disease? Why are you just going to treat the thyroid? I mean, I can't answer the question for the endo. The endo it has its own philosophy, but um, I know a lot of you out there watching this are super frustrated by that type of philosophy. My pain never gets better. I do all the things. I am miss Am I missing something? Well, I don't know what I do all the things means. A lot of people say they do all the things and they're not doing all the things right, or they're not really doing all the things, or they're doing all the things they've read or heard about, but not doing the things that are specifically unique that they need to be doing. And so if you're really still struggling, get testing done. 
testing without guessing, right? Because a lot of you that are at home and maybe, you know, maybe you've never had testing done, but you are think you're doing the right things, you know, go read my book. I read the first chapter, little girl, terminal, six months to live. Her name was Ginger. She was allergic to blueberries. Every morning she would eat a blueberry smoothie. Blueberries are a superfood, but they weren't a superfood for her. So she was doing all the things too, but she was doing them wrong for her. And that's my meaning is you need to understand what is right and wrong for yourself. And the only way you're really going to do that and overcome it is to get testing done so that you have a better idea of how to navigate it. Because if you're already doing everything right, you know, testing is going to be the next step. Relationship between high cortisol and autoimmune. Well, if you have autoimmunity, that means you, you most likely have a source of chronic persistent inflammation. And cortisol is your body's natural anti-inflammatory hormone. It's your stress hormones. Your body will produce more cortisol, at least initially in earlier stages of autoimmunity to try to combat the inflammation. And in so doing, that cortisol can elevate your blood sugar, elevate your blood pressure, and reduce your muscle mass, making your body dwindle. We, we, we um, talk about that in the, in the book, No Grain, No Pain, where I, I talk about the concept of grain inflammation and how cortisol ties into that. But cortisol is a very critical piece, but it isn't the cause of the problem, it's the consequence of the problem. How can your T3 levels be normal when your TSH is high? Very easy, TSH is not the, the best um, marker for thyroid hormone levels. TSH is a hormone that stimulates your thyroid gland to make T4 and T3. So you can have completely normal T3 and T4 and have an abnormally high TSH. You can also go in and get your blood drawn when you're on biotin or iodine, and you can get a falsely elevated TSH as well. So those of you running thyroid labs or getting your thyroid labs done, make sure you're not taking high doses of iodine and biotin when you do it, or you might get a misleading result. I did a mold air intake system test in a house. Penicillium and aspergillus came back at 8,500. If you're talking about an air test, yes, it's extremely high. Really anything over 900 is going to be considered high. Is aspergillus and penicillium dangerous? Yes. Gliotoxin, acrotoxin uh, are both mycotoxins or mold toxins produced by those two species of molds. So it very much could be impacting your health. Um, in the, you know, those mycotoxins increase risk for certain kinds of cancer, but they cause immunosuppression and they also suppress the production of DNA and RNA and protein synthesis. So what happens a lot of times people in mold won't heal because they're being exposed to high levels of these mycotoxins. Is it safe for the microbiome to use a couple of drops of iodine in glass in a glass of water? Yeah, there's no 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 problem inherently with that. Do you do fecal transplants? I don't. Um, you might check out who we interview, Doctor uh, Sab Sabine Hazan. Um, she does. She's a, a friend of mine out in California. She's a great GI doc. She's been very outspoken in Congress here lately or recently. Um, over the microbiome changes of people that develop um, COVID or get stuck. You, you can check her out if you want to. We'll put in a link to her interview, but you can look her up on, online and you can talk with her more in depth about that. She's out in California. I'm getting three amalgams removed in a month. Should I test for mercury and toxins first or should I just remove them to try to help? Uh, the removal of rheumatoid. I mean, you, if, if you've got silver amalgams and you're, you've got a good dentist who's going to protect you when they're removing them, it's perfectly fine to do so. Um, whether or not they're playing a role in your rheumatoid, it's, you know, it's hard to comment because, um, you know, a lot of people have silver amalgams that are not contributing to their autoimmunity, but it may be not be the case for you. It's hard to say. Can't answer that question with the, with the, small amount of information there but if you're already scheduled to have them removed and your dentist is clearing you and they're going to use protective dams and fans yeah I, it's not a bad decision
Well, I absorb my food better taking HCL and digestive enzymes. Should I take liquid as opposed to pill supplements? I don't like liquid supplements, not, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, a lot of liquids, uh, hard to keep them stable and hard to keep the, the ingredients from oxidizing. I prefer pills in that, in that regard, but will you digest better? Possibly if your stomach acid is low and your enzyme production is low, then taking the supplements might be very supportive of better digestion. Is it possible that a person is not genetically predisposed to gluten sensitivity and again have gluten sensitivity? Nobody knows the answer to that question. Everybody that comes to me, um, I have a very biased um, answer here because everyone that comes to see me in my practice, I mean, they struggle, they're struggling and that's why they're here. Um, and so we, we don't have, I mean, I do, we do get at gluten free society, we do get people that don't test positive for gluten sensitivity genetically, that, that happens. But I don't know those people. I don't have any historical information about any of those individuals. They're just using our testing services to try to, you know, get more information. But in my own, in my own practice experience, people with autoimmunity, I've, I've yet to see a person with active autoimmunity who is not gluten sensitive. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means I haven't seen it yet. My type one diabetic daughter is getting skin rashes. Doctor says it's blistering disorder. Any suggestions to help resolve? You gotta figure out what's doing it. Um, again, is it skin rashes, what does a blistering disorder mean? A blistering disorder means that something is irritative or inflammatory and it's coming out in the skin or something she's applying directly is affecting her skin. There are different types of skin disorders. Some of them can be kind of topically caused, meaning whatever your skin's being exposed to, um, it's irritated and therefore it, it's, it's flaring and rashes. You could also have skin rashes that are happening as a result of what you're being exposed to through internal consumption. And so it could be that she's got some type of food sensitivity or food reaction that has gone unrecognized, but it could also be that there's things in her soaps or shampoos or other products that she might be reacting to and, um, and that's why it's happening. Um, you know, it just, it just depends. You've got to do a deeper dive if her doctor, um, won't do a deeper dive. I mean, there are plenty of functional docs that might do a deeper dive with you. My father's 89 on metformin for type two diabetes. His pharmacist now wants to add trulicity. I'm concerned since he recently had a stroke causing some dizziness should always be concerned um, about any medicine that's being added. So, you know, it's hard for me to comment there because I don't know enough about your father, but you know, certainly at 89, you know, recent stroke. I mean, I, I would ask, here's the question I would ask. Well, it looks like his pharmacist wants to add trulicity, but a pharmacist is not a doctor. So um, pharmacist doesn't get to make that judgment call. That's really between your father and his prescribing doctor. Um, that being said, anytime a doctor wants to give a new medication, you should always sit down and have a conversation with that doctor about the risks of the medicine causing side effects or other potential problems versus the benefits of the medicine, right? With type to diabetes, I mean, we're talking about lifestyle here. This, is, this isn't this is rocket science. How willing is your father to change his diet and his exercise habits and other things? Even at 89, it's not too late. A lot of times doctors are like, oh, they're 89, just pump them full of drugs and call it a day. I don't believe that that philosophy is accurate. I think that's a flawed philosophy. Um, but I would encourage you to encourage your father to do those things that we know are counter to diabetes in terms of behavior. Um, and then I would encourage you to talk to the doctor about whether or not there are, are risks involved with your father taking Trulicity and what those are so that he can make the best possible decision for himself. Can you have a flare up suddenly without consuming gluten after your first, after you first go gluten free? 
you, you could have a flare for any variety of different reasons as it relates to neuropathy or any other inflammatory disease because, you know, the, the old adage that we live by, Mike, is um, everybody's entitled to more than one problem. And although gluten can certainly cause neuropathy, so too can lots of other things. And were you exposed to some of those other things or, or did you have some of those other things happen to you that could also contribute to neuropathy and just be clouding kind of your, your outcomes? It's hard to say. Oh man, children with anti-nuclear, nu you mean anti-nuclear antibodies. Uh, the rheumatologist is giving hydroxychloroquine and Umira for one and embryo for the other seems like we should be doing more yeah um wow i just don't understand why rheumatologists would use a biologic in a child i mean the, if you look at those drugs have some of the strongest black box warnings on them for cancer and you're talking about a child um just to me if you have an investigated diet and lifestyle with your kids you you should be doing that um, and work with a doctor who understands diet and lifestyle. Don't work with a doctor who doesn't understand diet and lifestyle and you're trying to force them to understand diet and lifestyle because that won't have a good outcome. You need to find an expert to work with. Does creatine monohydrate cause intestinal bloating and diarrhea? Not typically. Everybody has a different, um, could have a potential different response. A lot of creatine powders are contaminated with corn syrup and other sugars. And so you've got to watch out for some of these blended products. But if you're talking about pure creatine monohydrate, that's not at all a very typical side effect that, that I've ever seen in people that we put it on. Do you believe that you can be free from autoimmunity by diet exercise? Uh, yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. I mean, I've seen thousands of people go into remission. You know, what, what do you want to call it when their symptoms are gone and they don't need medicines? You know, um, doctors will tell you autoimmune disease is idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes it. But at the same time, they're saying that they're saying, however, we know that you need to be on this drug for the rest of your life. It makes no sense. I mean, think of it. Think of the logic of that. If you don't know what causes it, then how do you know I need to be on this medicine for the rest of my life? And what are the risks of this medicine for the rest of my life? Um, in my opinion, it's just an asinine approach. And um, in my experience, I just see too much of it go away with diet and lifestyle change. I mean, if you look historically since 1943, the rise of autoimmune disease has been exponential in the US. Prior 1943, we didn't have anywhere near the level. So it tells you that it's environmental and not genetic. If autoimmune disease were truly genetic, which is what a lot of people are being told, then you would have a pretty much the same prevalence of autoimmunity going back hundreds of years, which we just don't have. Um, so it tells you it's environmental change and there's a tremendous amount of environmental change from pesticide use to um, a variety of things they do to babies and infants to, um, you know, non-organic produce, produce grown with chemicals to chemicals being, you know, put in the water, you know, like bromine and chlorine and, and fluoride to people having surgeries, embedding artificial things in their body to people having tattoos that where they're injecting dyes and, and heavy metals into their body for the, you know, for the image of the tattoo to, you know, to food preservatives and additives. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's 3000 chemicals alone that have been added to the food supply and they call them generally recognized as safe without any valid safety trials or safety data. So we're exposed to all that. We are the consequence. We are the outcome of that. And you can't ignore all of those things. And some would argue that correlation is not, causation, but I would argue what, what the hell else is it, you know, and, and if you don't open your eyes to the fact that these are real things that have happened and people are sick or not better, despite the trillions of dollars that we spend on medication, we don't have better health, then we have a flawed system and a broken system that refuses to look at the truth and, you know, is profiting off the lie. And if you want to be part of their profit, that's your choice and your prerogative. I'm not here to judge any of you, but 
I am here to enlighten you. And if you're willing to look at it a different way, hopefully you, you'll catch a glimmer of education that you can apply in your life by watching the show. Dr. Osborne, do you have a vitamin B3, 100 to 150 milligrams? Yes, it's called Ultra B3. Um, we can put a link up for Lily on that. Okay, we're running out of time here. Actually, we ran out of time. Um, I definitely have a dairy allergy, but I can't stop butter. Tallow and ghee make me nauseous, so how bad is butter? Well, I mean, if you have a dairy allergy, you're damaging yourself. I don't understand why you can't stop it. You can stop it. You refuse to stop it. Chloe, you need to have a conversation with yourself about, you know, how much that butter is important over your health. Um, because you can stop it. You absolutely can. You're just not. I think I have gluten ataxia. Are the symptoms obvious if you have gluten ataxia? Do I need to get an MRI? Um, they can be obvious. I mean, the biggest one is dizziness, loss of balance, but you can also get an MRI. There uh, are MRIs that can help show you um, damage to the cerebellum in that regard or shrinkage of the cerebellum in that regard. So, but, but those MRIs are not, there are other reasons you can develop a, ataxia, not just gluten. So um, an MRI is not specifically diagnostic of gluten ataxia. You want to know whether gluten's contributing to it, you know, ideally get a gluten genetic test done. That's in my opinion, the best way to go about it. Okay. We're going to call it a wrap. I wish all of you a very, very wonderful Easter weekend. Um, look, if you want to support us at Gluten Free Society, we encourage you to do that. You know, this show is made possible by a lot of folks like myself and others behind the scenes. Uh, and there's three ways you can really support us. Number one, go to glutenfreesociety.org. Just sign up for our free information. Um, learn, apply what you learn, and go out in the world and be a beacon of light and hope for others to get better and heal from their autoimmunity. Uh, so support us in that way by being a beacon. Number two, you can support us by hitting the thumbs up, making sure you hit subscribe, and hashtagging this share with the hashtag save 100 million lives. The third way you can support us is use our products and services. And you can go to Gluten Free Society to the shop there. This weekend, we have a fantastic sale for you where you can save 15% off. That's a site-wide sale. So whether you are looking at nutritional supplements or whether you're looking at our bread mix or any of our lab offerings, we, we do food sensitivity testing, nutritional deficiency testing, and gluten sensitivity genetic testing. Any of those things this weekend is 15% off. You can use promo code EASTER2024 um, to activate that coupon. But however you want to support us, we appreciate you. We appreciate um, your, your constant attendance and kindness. And I, again, I wish you all a happy Easter weekend. We'll see you next Tuesday for another episode of the Dr. Osborne Zone. Take care.